Hi everybody, welcome back to chapter 6 of What Is Madame, part 1 of my trilogy, Bittersweet Goodbyes. We're at the point where Nathan and Madame has just waved goodbye to his eminence and Father Peter, and Madame concluded that it was a successful visit and that she felt very accomplished. But one of the priests that Nathan and his brothers during school time had encouraged to go down to the basement of the warehouse father who is the the person who runs the warehouse is father peter to go down and see if there's any of those stories that are floating about true in regards to there is a body in a coffin and other things that they've heard was there any truth to it father peter waves the letter and nathan takes that letter and in the secrecy of his bedroom he opens it this is both a revelation and the start of what's to come and the build up in the drama of the whole book. Now, in his bedroom, he opens the letter. Chapter six is called The Awakening because now the brothers and himself are starting to awaken to there's a lot more going on around them in the warehouse than they've ever known before. And now they get a taste of it. When I returned to my own bedroom, I threw the letter on my bed and tried my best to ignore it. I succeeded for a while by convincing myself there was nothing of a concern. And let me just stress that this is told through the eyes of Nathan, the whole story. One of the children that Madame is looking after in secrecy. But also remember that she has promised them because they were so good during his eminent stay that she would take them out of Linden Hall for the first time in their lives to Dublin for the day and to Croke Park to see a football match but that's all ahead of them and this is the awakening so we'll start again when I returned to my own bedroom I threw the letter on the bed and tried my best to ignore it I succeeded for a while by convincing myself that it was nothing of concern finally curiosity got the better of me and sitting myself near the bedroom window I opened the letter and began to read it began Dearest Nathan, I write this letter to you in the hope that what I've said should not be mentioned to anybody by you, Nathan. There is a lot to tell, but I have little time and paper for that matter. You were right. There is a hell down in the basement of the workhouse. However, even God, I'm sure, knows nothing about this living hell. It's one full of misery, and what my eyes have seen may you never witness. I discovered a coffin in one of the rooms when I went to see things for myself. The details of what I witnessed are far too horrific to write in words, especially to one so young. However, I will tell you about some of the less awful sights. There are children down there in what can only be described as cells with no daylight. They are starved until they give in to the priest's sexual demands. Yes, the sexual abuse extends to all those children, which are supposed to be protected by those priests. Even when the children do submit to their demands, they are beaten with sticks and urinated upon as a warning to remain quiet. They are washed down once a week with cold water and left, and left naked to dry, remaining there so they'll not be heard crying in the night before and after the abuse. When the priests become bored, these children are returned to work inside the workhouse as if nothing ever happened. Then more boys living in the workhouse replace those that have just left the basement and in turn, they are too sexually abused. It's a vicious circle of depravity, a continuous cycle that is often repeated. I managed to speak to a child through the keyhole of his cell who confirmed this. He showed me his tiny hand, which a priest had put through a mangle for kicking a priest in the ankle. Can you believe it? The child asked me for, po for poison so he could kill himself. The other sights I witnessed in the basement rooms are far too awful to mention. I'm going to pray that you will never go to the basement, at least not until you're old enough to cope with what it holds. I've seen what is now down there, and I beg you as a good person never to go there and seek out those horrors for yourselves. It will destroy you. The man above will deal with those perpetrators who are causing these children to suffer such barbarity as he sees fit. And I advise you, Master Nathan, go and live your life to the full. Be strong and venture forth with the knowledge that God is on your side. Don't let my discoveries affect the way you live your life, and don't seek revenge on the perpetrators. 
It'd be a waste of your energies. There is not enough time in this life to undo the harm done to those defenseless children. But you can protect yourself by never trusting any of the priests, especially those governed by Father Peter. I'm sorry I did not talk to you before I left, but I could not bring myself to. Please forgive me and be careful. You are much wiser than your years, and this could make trouble for you in your current surroundings. Try to stay happy for as long as you can, because I overheard that one day soon, your happiness should be taken away from you. Regards as always, Father Jared. I studied the letter shaking and decided to do what she, Sheila regularly had done to clear my head. And I went for a walk around the gardens of Linden Hall. It had been a long morning and I already felt lightheaded. I could hear my brothers celebrating with Nellie and took this opportunity to slip away quietly. I began to think about my maternal mother and heard a voice telling me that someday everything would become clear. I strolled around the grounds for some time trying to visualize clearly what Father Jared had seen in the basement of the workhouse. Eventually I decided to heed his advice and put the whole thing out of my head. I managed not to think about the basement for a few months. However, my thoughts repeatedly drifted back to the plight of those unfortunate children. I began to pray to God each night for some sort of divine intervention. Little did I know that that intervention would turn out to be me. On returning from my walk, I discovered that Madame had brought the day trip to Dublin forward to the following day, and my brothers were all numb with excitement and jumped around the place with joy at the prospect of finally tasting freedom. Tomorrow, tomorrow, we're going to be free. Tomorrow, exclaimed Adam when he saw me approaching. Yes, isn't it wonderful, I replied, trying to sound happy. And though I was guilt-ridden from thinking about the court, the poor kids suffering in the workhouse, I did what I could do to forget. Anyway, what could I ever do to help, I thought. We talked about the trip for the remainder of the day, and the following morning was a bright sunny one, and the boys decided to pack all they needed. Adam had found a book about Dublin, so of course this was the first of many things to be packed, and I, on the other hand, didn't do any packing. When asked why, I told my brothers that I wanted to travel light, and the only thing I needed was to bring myself. I'd already ventured outside Linden Hall on my trips to the workhouse. It was different from my brothers. They'd never been anywhere from the day they first entered. Only now, in their teenage years, were they getting to taste some freedom. But I was elated that at least my brothers were going on a trip together. Madame told us not to expect the weather to be so good. Therefore, she, sh she suggested we take some rainproof clothing just to be on the safe side. Looking out of the kitchen window and seeing the cones of the oak tree still open from the evening before, Nelly concluded that the following day would be a fine one. It had been an eventful week, and this trip was very definitely the icing on the cake. On the morning of the excursion, Father Peter rang early, giving numerous excuses as to why we shouldn't be allowed to go. And ignoring his pleas, Madame told Father Peter that his eminence had given his blessing for the trip before she promptly hung up. Next thing, Madame ordered Fred to have the car clean and ready for us to depart within the hour. He was only too delighted to, to comply and asked if his nephew, who was the same age as us, could also come along, and Madame agreed. At the time, as the time approached to leave, the boys became unsettled and nervous, causing Sheila to tell us we resembled children who had ants in their pants. The previous evening, after our usual cup of hot milk, we all had gone to bed, giggling and laughing a lot. It reminded me of Christmas Eve, and later Madame came to say goodnight. I became emotional over our excitement and anticipation of seeing the outside wor world together as one. As she bidded me good night, I hugged and kissed her gently, telling her just how much I loved her. Madame told me she felt the same way about the boys and myself before retiring to her own bedroom. The reason I was already tired is that we had all woken, awoke at six in the morning, much to Nellie's annoyance to eat our hot bread. She seemed upset but prepared our breakfast nonetheless. We were all becoming far too excited to have any interest in eating another special breakfast. And I was so anxious about this group trip with my brothers that I actually felt physically sick. Yes, I had ventured out with Sheila and Fred on the mission of mercy trips to the workhouse, but the fact that my brothers and I were going out for together as one 
gave me so much inner happiness. Nellie had prepared some of our favourite foods for this special occasion. She packed fish paste sa sandwiches and honey cakes as light snacks, both of which looked truly divine. For our lunch she cooked some mock black pudding with potato cakes and pea puree pancakes. To, to finish she had made cheese pudding for dessert to ensure that we indeed had a fine feast to savour. During the war and for some time afterwards food was scarce so we depended on potatoes for our main source of nutrition. We were blessed to have Nellie and the other kitchen staff who worked at Linden Hall. They were very adventurous and inventive when it came to their cooking. Having the land to grow some of the basics did help to alleviate the starvation we may have encountered otherwise. Once everything was ready, we promptly seated ourselves in the car, including Fred's nephew. We were all ready for our trip to Dublin. We jumped about all over the car, screaming with excitement, and little did we realise that we would return home later that day screaming, for a different reason. Settle down, boys. Is everything ready now? Madame asked from the front seat. Yes, we replied, clapping our hands with excitement. Then let's be off, since it's a long journey. Wave goodbye to Nellie, coaxed Madame. As we waved goodbye, Nellie wept and shouted for us to be good. We shouted back that we would and told her not to worry. We'd soon return. As Fred started the engine, we then went off on our way to experience Dublin as a family. The weather, as Nellie had predicted, was indeed good. The sun warmed our hearts as Fred left the roof open to allow us a better view of the bright blue sky. Not a word did we speak for the first full hour, for we were memorised by our first sighting of the village Glendora, which we had so far only seen from our bedroom windows at night. It was a market day, and there were people shouting everywhere. The sound of the horses and carts trotting up and down the village was exactly as we imagined them to be from our reading of books in class. Women sold flowers at the roadside and men haggled with each other over the price of chickens. There was a horse fair taking place and the children rode up and down the street bareback. Two children stopped playing to chase our car, asking if they could get in. One boy managed to climb onto the spare back wheel attached to the rear of the car and began shouting at us. Fred soon got rid of him. Then in the corner of the bustling village, we caught sight of a huge fight. Madame tried to get Fred to avoid it, but it was too late. We drove straight past it. She told us all to cover her eyes, but there was no way we were going to miss this. After all, it was our first real piece of outside action. The argument was over bags of potatoes. This confused us, but Luke was the one who asked the question all of us wanted an answer to. Why are they fighting over some silly potatoes, Madame? Her response was, it's not so silly, Luke. It's a reflection of the times we're living in. Food is a scarce commodity, with the war not being long finished. You should know this from your history lessons. Men who normally work the land, left to fight in the war, may not have returned to work the land, and instead they've chosen to return to cities to work. The process of food producing has now been left with only a handful of people, and demand outstrips supply. So there is never enough food available for everybody, and this causes people to have their own wars wars over food. Marcus leaned over when Fred began to speak and waving his finger at me he said now do you still want to talk about those disappointments you are prattling on to his eminence about earlier in the week? I think we're all very lucky to be living at Linden Hall if this is what's going on outside remarked Marcus. If you'd been listening properly to the argument you'd know I wasn't trying to say that I replied. I was referring to the maze and the suffering of the children there and if you had have no freedom to explore the outside world, then we are the same as those children in the maze. We're no different. That's what I was trying to make him believe and understand. His eminence said we could have one day out together as a result of that conversation. I never thought this day would even come, especially without any priests or supervisors. You know, you're becoming obsessed, Nathan. You ought to carry on with your own life and forget about those in the maze, insisted Marcus. I think if you understood their plight, you wouldn't say that, brother. You are completely missing the point it was making. A trip like this would never happen again if Father Peter had his own way. He was already ordering Madame this morning to cancel it. He wants us all to be like those children in the workhouse, to have nothing of what life has to offer. What ages are we all now? It's our first outing together as brothers, Marcus. I think this speaks for itself. 
So let us enjoy today now as it's arrived, and let us remember it well, I sigh. Do you really think there'll be more, no more days out after this, Nathan? Surely not. We're now out, and I think it's the start of the better things to come, replied the startled Tom. Maybe, Tom. We'll soon see, I winked. I never heard so much muttering. What a crew of chatterboxes. They must be getting hungry, though. I know I need to attend to nature's cause, said friends, Fred bashfully. Upon hearing the mention of food, we all screamed for Fred to pull over and let us out. But Anne warned us not to wander off too far and kept an eye on each other. But then she instructed Fred to park in the field nearby. When the car was parked, we immediately ran to the nearest available trees. While we were all relieving ourselves, Madame set up a small picnic area herself, and on our return she invited us to eat whilst she prepared herself for a walkabout. Everyone settled down. There was plenty of lemonade and honey pancakes here for everyone. You included, Fred, Madame announced. Oh, lemonade. Well, I brought my own special lemonade in this wee bottle, which I use for special occasions, cooed Fred to himself. So today is a special occasion, Fred, is it? You must tell me more, smiled Madame. Well, Madame, it's not often that I get a break from duty on such a fine day with a great bunch of lads and a wonderful employer and friend and get to enjoy a day trip out to Dublin with ye all, replied Fred gleefully. Why, thank you, kind sir. Your words are as colourful as the blooms I see before me, laughed Madame playfully. Your poetic response, dearest friends, brings sunshine to my heart, replied Fred mockingly. Uh, I hate to break this up, but I have more... Can I have more lemonade, Luke asked. Luke's timing was perfect, as Madame seemed slightly flustered by Fred's reply and was trying to laugh it off coolly. Afterwards, both of them went for a stroll, and Madame put up her umbrella to shield her from the sun, and Fred put on his bowler-type hat. We tidied up while they were gone and formally introduced ourselves to Fred's nephew. His name was Patrick, and he was a typical rough-spoken 13-year-old Irish lad, though his company disconcerted me somewhat. Up to now, I had been the eldest. Now this stranger would replace my seniority. All eyes were now focused on Patrick. So you're 13, hey? Educated or not, I inquired. His response, if you mean I can add one and one, the answer is yes. But at least on my fingers I can. Anyway, take a look, answered Patrick. He proceeded to show how he used his fingers to count. First displaying. Sorry, I just want to get this back. And I noticed that the camera has just... I know some people would like to see me, so sorry about that. So we'll go back. So you're 13. Hmm. Educated or not, I inquired. If you mean can I add one and one, the answer is yes. Well, at least on my fingers, I can. Anyway, take a look, answered Patrick. He proceeded to show us how he used his fingers to count, first displaying only one and then two in a V sign, raising them in the air in a gesture unfamiliar to me. Both Luke and Tom erupted into uncontrollable fits of laughter and congratulated him. Marcus and Adam and I stood dumbfounded until Tom whispered the meaning to us. I felt much belittled, and the only way to salvage some pride was to try and make friends with him before, Red return before Fred returned with Madame. Fred speaks very highly of you, Patrick, said Luke. Really? <laughs> That's strange. As I met my uncle for the first time only a few weeks ago, before that, he didn't even know I existed. So I'm very surprised he has much to say about me, replied Patrick wearily. Right, well, maybe I'm confusing you with somebody friend gives a shite about. Oh, sorry, if I offended you, snarled, snarled Luke. Your speech is similar to that of someone who has come from one of those workhouses, added Tom abruptly. I don't come from one of those workhouses. 
I've never been battered or abused. Of that I can assure you, Sir Patrick, raising his voice. In fact, each one of you could have come from one of those places if rumours are right. Only for Madame offering you a home, that's where you all would be now. Fred was right when he said that tongue of yours would get you into serious trouble one of these days asking so many questions, Master Nathan. So listen here, all of you. Until I get to know you properly, I will not answer any more of your questions, okay? replied Patrick on defensively. My brothers obviously did not like his attitude as they began to circle around him with clenched fists. He responded immediately by leaning towards them. It was at this point that I intervened, walking into the circle holding a glass of lemonade. I asked Patrick to accept my apology, and I told him that I was out of order and not, and not really had meant to cause any offence. agreed that I had asked too many questions and suggested that given time he would come to love and respect his uncle just as much as we did, and that in time he would also become part of our family. As we shook hands, everyone clapped. We thanked God we did not fight, because just then Fred and, and Madame returned from their walk. Well, well, Madame, I wonder why we deserve a round of applause. It would almost encourage you to go away more often, wouldn't it? said Fred, laughing. Fred, <laughs> really, you will give the boys the wrong idea about our walks, Madame announced as she walked towards us. I'm glad to see that you have packed everything away. Now please go to the toilet once again before you get back in the car. Dublin is a long way off and we'll not be stopping any time soon. Don't say you were not warned in advance, added Madame, turning towards us. Right then, young Patrick, how are you getting on? Fred asked his nephew. Everyone stopped what he was doing and waited in anticipation of that reply. When Patrick said OK, everyone breathed a huge sigh of relief. Once we were back inside the car, each of us thanked Patrick for not squealing on us. I believed I had now met someone who was as generous and intelligent as I considered myself to be, and I felt compelled to reach out and hug him, but instead I waited for the opportunity to be rewarded by him. We started to sing some old Irish lullabies on the journey to Dublin. Madame pre pre pretended to hum along from the front, but it was obvious that she didn't know the lyrics much to Fred's amusement, and Patrick was mortified and turned the colour of his red hair. Next he referred to these songs as those terrible old granny songs that only the old ones would ever sing. Not put off, we continued to sing even louder. Poor Patrick tried to curl up and hide himself under his jacket in shame. I told him he would continue to get louder, and we would, until he decided to join in. By the time we reached Dublin, Patrick was singing in fair, in Dublin's fair city louder than anyone else. Madame became shocked when she heard some of the verses, but chose not to say any, anything. Chapter 7 Revelations For my brothers and myself, growing up in the home built like a fortress was normal, and we considered ourselves special children. However, we had agreed amongst ourselves that it was tough listening to the staff constantly talk about the outside world, even mentally tougher when the priests who tortured us remained silent on the subject of life beyond the high walls of Linden Hall. Therefore, those books we read in the library fed our inquisitive minds, leaving our imaginations to run riot with fantasies about the outside world and what it was actually like. You would think, wouldn't you, that we'd have grabbed the first opportunity to escape. Of course, it crossed our minds to do this many times. However, the mental conditioning we endured by the priests who tortured us left us too scared to ever attempt this. And our souls were already destroyed by their actions and their minds too on our minds too fragile from listening to the horror stories that they had informed us about, about the outside world. On top of that, the repercussions of trying to escape meant losing each other. Therefore, we decided it was not worth the risk. Instead, we patiently waited and waited, never quizzing why we would not at least have one day out. We even tried to tease information out of any new priests that tutored us while we remained captive, but this always failed too. Now that day had arrived to piece together what we had read about in books, and it was not just going to be an adventure, but a dream come true. These days I can only vaguely remember coming to Linden Hall at the age of five. Recently I had turned twelve, and yet I was nervous about experiencing this shared freedom with my brothers the same freedom I lost as a child. It seemed surreal that now I was about to experience it once again. I knew it would be short-lived, only one day, but still I was trembling at the thought of experiencing the first normal day in our restricted lives 
Our silence grew as we entered Dublin, and the array of buildings that greeted our eyes was nothing like we'd ever seen before. They were tall and beautifully crafted with Georgian features that would captivate even the hardiest of people. Our eyes became bigger than our heads, taking in the sights. Madame explained the history behind the buildings of such fine homes and told us they were now divided up into tenement flats for the growing population that had moved into Dublin seeking work and a better life. In these homes they had lived in cramped conditions. My mind started to having memory flashes and before man had a Madame had a chance to finish her sentence. The area we were now entering is called, I called the name out instead. It's Mountjoy Square, Madame, I yelled aloud. I surprised everybody with my outburst. It happened with uncontrollable sense of urgency. And Fred looked into the rearview mirror and smiled at my knowledge, even though he echoed Madame's concern that it was a rough place and one for us to avoid. I implored them both to drive as near to the place as possible. It was very important for me, and I made the excuse that I wanted to see the other half, the other half lived before travelling on to O'Connell Street. Nathan, you seem very anxious to see somewhere where I've been told to avoid, and I think it would be better to be wiser to follow my instinct on these matters in order to avoid and prevent any problems. Why on earth, Nathan, would you want to, and or even feel the need to go there, Madame inquired. Madame, I wouldn't ask. But there's a burning desire within me to see it. Please, I don't wish to hold you all back from your day's outing. But I feel I know this place. I don't know how, but my instinct tells me I do. Please, can we, I implore. <sighs> really, I, I don't know how this could be. I think those books you have read are confusing your mind with reality. There is no way, Nathan, that you could know of such a place. To prove me right, I suppose another 15 minutes added into our journey to briefly look around is fine. After all, we're safe in the car. Then once you've seen a little of this area, we shall go. That way it will not deter us from enjoying our day as planned, replied Madame, while, while instructing Fred to drive around the area. <sighs> OK, Master Nathan, I'll drive around as it sounds important to you, nodded Fred. Thank you, Fred. I do appreciate this. I'd not have rested otherwise, I replied in an anxious tone. Oh, well, in that case, we must go there at once. We can't have Master Nathan feeling uneasy for the day, laughed Madame. In the back of the car, Patrick looked at me funnily and asked in a whispered tone how I knew it was Mountjoy Square. He had known this place well when he had lived in Dublin, and it was a rough area, he said. He offered to accompany on, on any walk should I decide to venture out of the car. He was a wise guy, this Patrick because he instinctively knew that all common sense would go and I would tear away at the nearest chance I had to go search out what was in my head. I asked him how he knew this place. Patrick shrugged his shoulders and said that instead of a burning desire to see it as I wanted, he had a burning desire never to see it again. He looked solemnly out of the window, much to the dismay of the others. Did you have to become so serious again, Nathan? What is it with you these days? We're supposed to be enjoying ourselves and having the time of our lives. And and then this happens again. However, you, Nathan, have to go and spoil it with some fantasy trip just to settle your head. Christ, brother, when it rains, it pours with you. When will it ever end, Marcus added in anger. Holding Marcus' shoulder, I leaned over and said, Marcus, please, in all the times I've asked you to understand me, this is the most important. It'll fall into place when I get there. Please, all of you, trust me on this, I whispered sternly. During all our mutterings, Madame and Fred were discussing on whether the safest place was to park, and it was a rare sight indeed to see a car, and we knew our car would cause a, cause a stir amongst the locals. So for this reason, and this reason alone, Fred thought it best to park away from the square. Madame had then turned round to everyone and asked me to get out slowly out of the car and for my brothers to remain inside, and not to draw any unwarranted attention. Fred also instructed Madame to remain seated. In the distance, we noticed a group of children who came to a sudden halt, and they spotted our big black car parked in their midst. A young girl came running towards us, but suddenly stopped. And as we got out, she approached Fred, and they remained staring at each other for some time. This wee girl must have thought aliens had just landed. Then gradually, she edged forward and began to smile whilst brushing away some tangled hair from her sunken eyes. 
Her face was dirty and her clothes were torn. She had makeshift shoes on her feet with the twine. And clenched in her hands was a little rag doll that swayed back and forth as she rocked herself, watching and anticipating our every move. Madame's heart softened as she came into view. With the declaration of, how beautiful she looks, the girl relaxed and moved even closer towards the car. Madame warned my brothers not to make any sudden moves which might scare her. In turn, I saw my brothers peering out of the car, shocked by her appearance. Who are you? She asked Fred. My name is Fred, and this boy next to me is called Nathan. What is your name? He asked. Oh, that depends. Mummy told me I'm not to say anything to strangers. But sure, you're one of those, are you not? What is that in your head? Inquired the girl in a strange tone. It's a hat. It keeps my head warm. Do you like it? Fred replied. Sure, I've never seen one before. No, I don't like it. I would like to put it on my head, though. I'll give it you back. I promise, she smiled. With an exchange of looks, I felt compared to nod my head, indicating that Fred should allow her. And so the exchange took place, and Fred rubbed his head as the cool air replaced the warmth he enjoyed whilst wearing it. Madame turned her head to the side to distract the little girl's attention from requesting the same of hers, and powdered it one and decided to powder her nose. Madame felt less guilty. However, poor Fred suddenly noticed the girl run away with his hat waving in the air, and as she did so, she started shouting, I am a liar, I am a liar, my tongue will end up on fire, ha ha, you've been the last, you've seen the last of me, I'll never be back for you to see, she laughed. With that, I saw my opportunity to escape Fred's clutches, and I immediately pursued her screaming, I'll get it back for you, Fred. In the background, I could hear the rest of my family roaring, No, Nathan, no! Then Patrick jumped out of the car, running past Fred, shouting, I'll bring him back. Fred was now flustered and turned around to face an irate madame. All I could hear was the wrath of her tongue, along with my brothers, pleading for me to come back. However, I ran further and further away as the adrenaline pumped through my veins. Then I began slowly slowing down to look around me. And what should have been more strange was, in fact familiar. As my brain absorbed these surroundings, I began to look hard at the park nearby. Transfixed, I then looked at the houses. Exploring my mind, I recognised I had once played here before. I remembered the street's name, Gardenia Lane, next to Mount Joyce Square. Then from the darkness of my old memories, long forgotten, it all came flooding back. As I looked upwards, I saw children in the distance. They circled all around, a small blonde child poking fun at him. These apparitions were all of, of my lost childhood. The children surrounded a now terrified young boy, and as I looked harder, I realised they were in fact surrounding me. My God, I found the place of my childhood again, I cried. I remembered how cruel these children had been to me, always jeering at me for having no shoes and no father, and how they bullied me a lot by hitting me, and then made me cry and constantly made fun of me all the time. They often ignored me, and not once did I ever tell my mother. Being so tired after work, I knew that she would never have the energy to defend me. So when Patrick found me, he found me banging my head with my fists clenched, while continually going around in circles calling out, No, no, I do have a daddy. And then, with a reassuring hand placed on my shoulder, I stopped with the sound of Patrick speaking to me. It's okay, Nathan. I'm here now. All be fine, he smiled. My response is, no, it won't, Patrick. That's the problem. I found the place where I used to live before I was taken so cruelly away from my mother. I was so young, Patrick. I thought I had only forgotten until now. In fact, I know these streets. Over there is Garden Lane, where I once lived. L look, my legs are shaking with shock. Look at them, I cried. It's nerves, Nathan, at what lies ahead of you. If you wish, we can go together and look at your old home if you're up to it, added Patrick sympathetically. Do you think that my real mother might still be living there in the old house, do you? I inquired. Oh, I don't know that. Well, of course I wouldn't know that. It's just Patrick stammered then. Look, Nathan, we're all going to have a look, and that's it. Otherwise, I'll never hear the end of it. Plus, the day will be ruined for everyone, if not already. We cannot stay long when Madame will have a search party out for us. So let's make it quick, added Patrick, consistently. As we began to walk around my choice square, a group of boys stopped playing a game called Kick the Can, and standing next to him was the girl I was running after. 
They then proceeded to talk and walk behind Patrick and me, making fun of our clothes and my accents. The young girl kept shouting, I told you, I told you. I walked with trepidation while Patrick walked calmly. He seemed very relaxed. So we have newcomers on our patch, hey guys? Where do you think you're going to? Shouted one of them. Ignore them, Nathan. And leave all the talking to me, whispered Patrick. Okay. But maybe they're right. We should head back while the going's good. I don't want any trouble, Patrick, I replied nervously. There won't be. When they realise who I am, they'll back off, Patrick smirked. I, I don't understand. What do you mean? How would they know you, I asked. Before I came to Linden Hall, he responded, to stay with my Uncle Fred. I also lived here with my parents. My father died some years ago in the shipyard, and he used to deliver the goods from the ships directly to the shops by horse and cart. One day the horse bolted, and my father lost control, falling beneath the cart. He ended up one mile up the road before the horse had stopped. Some local lads freed him. He died two, two days later. My mother never coped after that and failed in health. In one evening she killed herself by jumping into the river Liffey, responded Patrick, sighing heavily. Good God, I don't know what to say. Uh, sorry seems inappropriate, but, but, but I am sorry. I, I, I too lost my mother, Patrick. However, a priest who gave her something caused our separation. She worked in the local convent as a cleaner, and that's all I know about her. I never knew my father or what became of him, but I'm sure this is where I once lived with her, I replied, teary-eyed. Huh? So, Nathan, we aren't that much dif different than each other then. I hope something good comes out of this visit today to, our, to your old home, smiled Patrick. Well, at least I feel safe with you, Pat. Thanks for helping me. At least I'm beginning to piece together what is left of my past life. For I need to do this so I can understand what the future might hold, I replied. Meanwhile, the sounds of jaunts of the group following us got closer and closer with more children joining in. Then, after firing a stone at my head, the elder of the local boys spoke. We ignored him and walked a little faster. Instead, in front of us, some boys on a used bike emerged from a side alley street, shouted abuse at us. Then, as we walked across the street, some older people met us and shouted, where the fuck are you two sissies going to? It became scary being in the midst of such poverty, especially as we were dressed as two public school kids. And of course we drew only suspicion and anger from the locals. Women talking over the hedgerows stopped and stared and then laughed at us. Ooh, we're honoured. Look at what great star presents. We have royalty in our street. Nice shoes, Blondie. I'd love them for my young and sniggered one woman. My, my, Sylvia, they look scared. What are you up to here, lads? You seem lost. Can I help you at all? Asked the other woman, puffing on a cigarette. Yes, we're all looking for my mother and wondered if she still lives here, I asked. Your mother? Hmm. Your mother, you say? Well, she must have done well in life with you, dressed the way you are. Anyway, son, what was the name, asked the first woman. She was known as Margaret Reynolds. It would have been seven years ago now or thereabout, I replied. Hmm, they're about. Very formal indeed, especially for a boy so young. Well, let me see. What did you exactly do for work like? inquired Sylvia, nudging the second woman. She worked in the local convent and was a good friend of Robbie Garrett, I asked. I, I responded. Now there's a family name I thought had never be mentioned again. You remember the Garrett family? Jeez, they ruled these streets while they lived here, so they did. The mother was committed to a lunatic place, you know that. Actually, yes, crazy woman. What did you say your mother's name was again, asked Sylvia. Margaret Reynolds. She was very beautiful. Long black hair to her knees. She always, always tired. I remember people liked her a lot, I smiled. Margaret, you say? Hmm. Well, let me think. Where did you exactly live, asked the first woman. I think it was the last house at the end there, I stammered. But that cannot be. Sure, I've lived, I lived there, my child, for over 20 years. Now, no, no, unless you are, but, but this cannot be. I, I mean, my God, heaven upon high, it can't be Madge's little son, Michael. Your mother lost you, she told me. As if you are indeed the same child who now stands before me all grown up. You lived in the basement flat, didn't you, son? She asked. 
she continued I think so that makes that makes sense I, I responded of course it does if you've the birthmark on your right cheek she replied not to my knowledge I'd have noticed it by now surely I replied no no you're right to be confused son I meant on your arse I don't know how, how to say it posh, but yes, your bum. Yeah, that'll have to do, she nodded. Don't know, to be honest. Could never quite see that far, I mumbled cheekily. But if you want to help, you will do the honours and let me say, come in to me. Well, we find out, and soon enough we'll have the answer. You have to be legit, as no one else would have known those details of Maggie's. I used to babysit you on a rare occasion for your mother when she worked late. This is how I know you have that personal mark in there. Look, we've all got to call it today, Nathan. So go inside and do what you have to do. I'll wait outside here and deal personally with our unwelcome visitors, insisted Patrick, staring at all the kids surrounding us now. Okay, I'll be back soon, I replied, hopefully. And as I ventured into the woman's house, I could not believe the mayhem. Looking around me, the first thing that hit me was the smell of urine and feces coming from the slop buckets. She explained that this was... The last job of her day. She'd taken up cleaning the whole house for the landlord to keep money coming in. It was not a job for a woman, but it paid her for the repairs and jobs to her house when they occurred. And as she examined my arse, I sensed a long period of silence. Sitting there weeping, she looked up at me, crouched in the most unusual position on the floor. Taking her hand away from her face, she revealed her sad eyes. Indeed, it's you. My God, the devil arose and has appeared to many when you came here this day. My, how you have changed. And what fine clothes you now wear, Michael. And the more I look, the more I see you're the image of your mother. You should be glad about that. It's not your father you look like, she wept. Well, hold on. So you knew my father then? Please, I need to know who he is. You cannot tell me half a story without finishing it. Please, I begged her. My name is Kitty Johnson, son. Does that ring a bell with the fine head of yours? I used to watch out for you in the streets to make sure you were safe. And one day your mother told me you went missing, and for days the whole neighbourhood searched for you. I'm afraid now that that wasn't true. I was taken away from my mother and brought to a new home called Linden Hall, I responded. A woman called Madame is now rearing me. I don't know the reason I was taken that day. That's why I'd like you to get in touch with my real mother and ask her why this happened and why she never came back to the home I sighed. It was, I see, all a lie, a terrible lie, and she lied to me of all people. That I'll never understand, responded Kitty in a firm tone. But I see your new life came with a new name. My, they do say, what goes around comes around. And if this is part of it, well, the shite has hit those buckets reflects my state of mind right now. I don't know how I'm ever going to get over this meeting. I suppose you now want to know where she is too, she asked, and then continued. But that's simple enough. Your mother was taken to some new workhouse or convent on the instructions of the mother superior. She, she was expecting another youngin. But where she went to after that, I'm not too sure. It was in the country, I believe, she was taken to. That's all I know. God, it was so long ago. Let me think. I think it was called Farnway House. Yep, there you are. I remembered it. That's what it was called, cried Kitty, blowing her nose. I was still bent over when she told me to cover up and escorted me back outside. There she emphasised that my father was just somebody that my mother knew, and that's all she could tell me. I felt she wanted to tell me more, but at least I had some information that my mother was still in Ireland and still alive. Outside, Patrick was fighting with one of the older guys and his two friends, and immediately I ran to his defence, I ended up fighting with a tall, skinny person. Kitty then screamed at them for them to stop. We immediately stopped, then one of the guys called for more backup. The young lad that arrived was named Aidan, who had a scar on his face. And after staring long and hard at him, I recognised him. As he came running forward, I shouted his old nickname, Buster. He stopped dead in his tracks and looked at me up and down, puzzled. Staring at me further, he turned around and told the others to back off. Patrick stood looking at both of us as we moved towards each other. Then with a screech of total surprise, he shouted my name. Mikey! And I asked, and he asked me, was it I? 
Then mocking me, he asked me what it was like to have come back from the dead. <sighs> yes, Buster, it's me. I'm so glad you're here. How are you, my old friend? I, 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 I asked. I stretched out my hand to shake his. However, he leaned forward and patted my shoulder instead and rubbed my head. Well, well, haven't you changed? Everyone thought you'd been kidnapped and that your mother moved away because she couldn't cope. Well, or something like that. It's a small world when your past comes staring at you in the face again. You're a real welcome sight, Mikey. It feels strange to look at you all grown up and looking so dashed, laughed Buster. I'm glad it was you they called for us, as I need to get back to my adoptive mother. We'll be in serious trouble, otherwise. But look, would you help us get back to safety, Aiden? We can talk along the way. Things are a little crazy, but I'll try and explain some of it, I added. No problem. Back off, everybody, he shouted. I mean it. Well, you'll all suffer at my hands, roared Buster to the others. Tell me this, Mikey. Who's your friend here with the familiar face, he asked. This is Patrick. Without his friendship, I wouldn't be standing here now. Turning round, I looked at him hard and said, Thanks, Patrick. You've no idea what this meant to me. I'll implore Fred and Madame go easy on you, I promise, I said. In response, he replied, Don't worry, Nathan. I mean, Mikey. I'll be okay. I can look after myself. Indeed you can, Trigger. Jeez, God, what a day. Two runaways come back to the home, said. This dump must be doing something right, bringing you two back. Sorry, Kitty, for upsetting you, Buster shouted to Kitty. Well, I have a little task for, for them ones over there fighting my guests. Seeing as I've had bad back, if they can help me, I'll forgive them for upsetting my friends here, smirked Kitty, winking over at Sylvia and me. Whatever it is, they'll do it right, lads, insisted Buster, turning to the other children. Yes, came back their response. As we made haste back to Madame, we decided to make up a story that we got lost and found each other again through Aiden. And as I walked back to the car, I inquired how the two of them knew each other and explained through rival gangs and fighting. Aiden declared that if anyone had once suggested that he'd be talking like old friends, he would have punched them for their stupidity. And then Buster and I started to reminisce about old times. I struggled with the information I was hearing about my old homestead and Manchester Square and the things Buster and I once got up to. I tried in vain to piece so many things together in the gaps in my head I had about those missing years. There was no answers for me concerning my real mother when I inquired. Anyway, we were all children after all, in a time when adults either worked, drank or simply did not care. We'd survived by spending all day playing games with each other or walking the streets. The parents moved on in life as my mother had done. They were forgotten about. You were okay in their eyes as long as you had one problem less for them to worry about. <clears throat> one hour later, we all arrived back to a distraught Madame and Fred. They now had a guardly officer accompanying them. The local children jeered fun as they surrounded them again. Infuriated at seeing us, Madame walked briskly towards me and slapped my face hard. <clears throat> Excuse me for a minute. And then she began to cry. How could you, Nathan? How in God's name could you ruin a day that was meant to be so perfect that your brothers had to look forward to for so long? How dare you run away like that, ignoring our pleas to come back? You've ruined this day for everybody, shouted Madame continuously. As for you, Patrick, you're not my concern, but I think your uncle will have a few choice words to say to you, continued Madame. I hope you both have a good explanation for what's been going on for the last hour. It's been the longest hour of our lives. Really, Patrick, being the eldest, I would have expected you to have behaved more responsible. There's no excuse for ignorance. If you had not consideration for yourselves, then you ought to have shown some towards those you left behind, behind shouted Fred. But I wanted to take the blame, after all, if I hadn't run away, then none of this would have happened, madame. All I can say is I'm truly sorry. My brother's... I'm sorry to all of you. To you, Fred, I'm sorry as well. Who have looked up to you as a father figure for so long. I, Mr. Gardy, for your time that's been wasted, I'm also sorry. And I, I continued in a distraught tone. All, all of you have to forgive me. There was no intention to hurt any of you to ruin your day. One hour can be made up if we get on our trip now and deal with this later. Madame, I promise whatever punishment you dish out, I will take it. 
and I'm so sorry to each one of you, honestly I am, was my conclusion. You were always one for words, Nathan. That was what excludes you time and time again from punishing you. However, on this occasion, it shall be different. The anguish you've put us through is inexcusable and far from forgivable. And I'm beginning to think Father Peter could be right. Because if you continue to carry on like this, maybe some time away to a reform school will do you no harm. I certainly don't want you and your brothers following your footsteps, replied an exasperated madame. Immediately, my brothers implored her not to send me away, and Tom began to cry. Silence, everybody! I have spoken. Tom, I did not say this would happen. It just might so, depending on Nathan's behaviour over the next few weeks. Now it's up to him, reiterated Madame as she stroked his face. Well, ma'am, I think you have the matter in hand, and it's all well that it ends well. To both of you, I'll say this. To go missing without a care for anyone else is a terrible thing. It leaves those left behind thinking the worst. And to return and take to punishment is, in my eyes, makes for two very fine young men. It's obvious no real harm was done here, but lads, you should be more careful next time. Trust me, the streets around here can be cruel places, and you might not return the next time, added the guard or officer. Oh, trust me when I say this, officer, that for a certain somebody... There'll be no next time for a very long time to come, Madame replied sternly. Well, that's your prerogative, ma'am, and I trust you you'll safely travel and enjoy what's left you for your day in Dublin. Goodbye to all of you, and I'll escort you out of here and on the famous O'Connell Street nearby. And let's be on our way, implored the guard officer. I bid Aidan farewell and promised that some days our paths would cross again. I offered to write to him, forgetting for a moment that he couldn't write and I told him to hold on to the belief that we would indeed meet, and I looked forward to it. Patrick nodded in response, and then we retreated to the car without uttering another word. We acted quickly before another outburst from the dam. Thank you for listening. That was chapter six and seven, and I look forward to continuing with chapter eight. Take care for now.